Is this the best gaming monitor for those who want to play on consoles and PCs? Well, today we're looking at the BenQ Mobius EX3210U, which sports a 32-inch flat IPS panel that operates at 4K and at 144Hz. It has those fabled HDMI 2.1 ports, Display HDR600 certification, AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, and also has got built-in speakers and even a built-in microphone. Now all of this comes in at roughly £830 in the UK and $750 in the US, at least of course at the time of filming. Now in this video, which has been sponsored by the manufacturer, I'll be covering everything you need to know about it so you can make your own informed purchasing decision. So to kick things off, I want to talk about its input lag, and here I had it objectively tested at just 0.6 milliseconds. Indeed, it is pretty impressive, and you can see how it compares to a few of the modern monitors that I've tested. Now as for its response time, it's very much linked with the AMA level. The higher the AMA level, the better the response time will be, but then you might get some inverse ghosting, which I'll touch upon very shortly. Now first off, using the AMA level 0 and using the OSRTT tool to clock in a measurement, at the average initial time at 11.09 milliseconds. You'll be able to see this at the bottom left hand side of your screen. Now going on AMA level 1, this drops down to 8.43 milliseconds. Going to AMA level 2, which is the one I would actually suggest, it goes to 6.24 milliseconds. And finally, on AMA level 3, it gets down to 5.68 milliseconds. Although if you note towards the middle of your screen, you've got a bit more RGB overshoot. And indeed, this is actually a little bit visible specifically if you're playing more intense games. For me to demonstrate it, I've got the UFO ghosting test, and you might be able to notice a little bit more of haloing and a bit more of this inverse ghosting on the AMA level 3 in comparison to AMA level 2. Now furthermore, you've also got a blur reduction mode, and this can be used simultaneously with the AMA level modes, which shows great sort of versatility. Here I had it tested with the AMA level 2, which I'd recommend, and also the maximum AMA level, which is level 3. Now elsewhere, I also had it tested at 120Hz and 60Hz, given that this monitor is aimed at console gamers as well. And here you can see how it performs with the AMA level 2 and level 3 at both 120Hz and 60Hz, and furthermore, at 120Hz, you do still have a blur reduction mode. However, this mode becomes disabled and greyed out at 60Hz, which should come as almost no surprise given the frequency that it runs at. In other words, you will actually notice quite a lot of flickering. Now, as for its response time at 120Hz with AMA level 2, it sticks at 6.33 milliseconds. As for AMA level 3, it drops down to 5.04 milliseconds. Now at 60 Hz, however, you can see here that AMA level 2, the average initial time sits at 6.73 milliseconds, and at level 3, it sits at 6.05 milliseconds. Now past all these tests that I've just shared, I would just like to highlight that these were all attained via DisplayPort, purely because via my NVIDIA control panel, I was able to select between 144, 120 and 60 Hz. However, the 144Hz option became disabled when I connected over HDMI, which is slightly odd because there is no sort of console mode that you can enable or disable through the monitor's OST, and furthermore, given that this monitor has got full bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports, and so does my RTX 3080. Nonetheless, this should be a non-issue for most because those people connecting over PC will want to use DisplayPort and those wanting to connect over a console will of course have the full bandwidth of 120Hz at 4K. Now furthermore, I would also like to highlight that thanks to the HDMI 2.1 standard, you have also got full VRR support. In other words, you've got the ability to have that tear-free gaming experience, be it if you're using a modern day console or indeed a modern GPU on a computer. In this respect, I was able to run 120Hz 4K with HDR and NVIDIA G-Sync all working simultaneously together without any sort of flickering or tearing issues, and indeed gave me a fantastic experience. Now while that's all very impressive, BenQ has got a trick up its sleeve. See here, if you were to disable HDR, you will be able to note that blur reduction mode can actually be enabled simultaneously with NVIDIA G-Sync or indeed VRR technologies and at 120 and at 144Hz, which is certainly quite a novelty in the monitor space. So moving swiftly on, I should talk about HDR. And here it's got Display HDR 600 certification, which is certainly impressive. 
However, it is worth considering that it only has 16 local dimming zones, and these can be only enabled or disabled via an HDR signal. If you're running an SDR signal, local dimming is not available. So just some food for thought. So moving on from the gaming sections, let's talk about its image quality. Now, as a reminder, it has got a flat 32-inch IPS panel with a matte coating on it. Now, 3D Monitors OSD, there is a dedicated sRGB mode that one can select. Thankfully, over here, you have actually got full brightness controls. Now, in said mode, using my calibrators, I noted an sRGB gamut coverage of 96.8% and a gamut volume of 101.3%. You can see below how it compares to the sRGB standard. As for its color accuracy, it sits at 1.28 as an average delta E and a maximum of 3.78. Now, as for its test of contrast ratio, it sits at 818 to 1, while the measured white point is 6,766 Kelvin at 100%. As for the gamma curve, it actually sits pretty close to the 2.2 standards. Now, the monitor does actually have a wider color gamut, so therefore, if you're not going to be editing in the sRGB space, you might actually want to go on one of the other user modes in order to get a little bit more of that image pop. Now, in the user modes, I actually had its sRGB, DCI-P3 and Adobe RGB all positively affected. Below, you can see how it compares to the Adobe RGB standard, where it sits at 95.4% and 111.2% in the gamut coverage and gamut volume, respectively. Now, as for the average delta E, it sits at 3.07 and a maximum of 6.18. As a reminder, this is now against the Adobe RGB standard rather than the sRGB that I did reference before. Now, the test of contrast ratio doesn't change, however, the measured white point does a little bit at 6698 Kelvin at 100%. Below here, you can see how the gamma curve actually sits in comparison to the 2.2 standards. Now, aside from its color performance, what about when it comes to the overall brightness? Well, here in HDR, I noted 541 nits, which is actually below the manufacturer's claim and the display HDR600 certification. Nonetheless, I can only go based on the tools that I've got. Now, as for the maximum SDR brightness, it sits at 268 nits, while with blur reduction enabled, this drops down to 189 nits. Speaking of which, it does get all the way down to 49 nits with blur reduction mode, and without it, it gets down to 52 nits, therefore showing good sort of range. Now, aside from peak luminous, what about when it comes to brightness uniformity? Well, of course, this is somewhat panel lottery, but you can see how my tested panel actually performed. In terms of the overall backlight bleed, here are the images. Now, it's worth noting these were done in SDR with, of course, local dimming being disabled. However, if I were to enable HDR and indeed enable local dimming where the option becomes available, you can see that the image is completely pitch black. Now, aside from all these tests, I would just like to talk about its build quality. And here it's got three side borderless design with a relatively chunky bottom bezel. The reason behind that is because you've got two forward-facing speakers, which I'll touch upon very shortly, and the BI Plus sensor, which is located towards the middle of the bottom bezel. Now, this effectively allows the monitor to adjust its color temperature based on its own ambient lighting conditions, which is quite handy and therefore shows why this monitor has got quite a few different eye certifications. Now, of course, you can enable or disable the feature through the OSD. Speaking of which, the monitor settings can be accessed through a set of physical buttons which are located underneath the monitor, or better still, through the wireless remote. This indeed allows you to adjust the settings from the fly and indeed from afar. Now, as for the monitor's OSD, it is comprehensively laid out and provides you a plethora of different options. It is worth considering over here that if you do not have, for example, an HDR signal, the local dimming option will not be present. But of course, if you do enable HDR, you will see it. Elsewhere, it's actually quite rare to see that you have actually got an HDMI CEC option that you can toggle through via the Systems tab. Now, past this, the monitor stand is actually very chunky, but it does give you a very sturdy feel. Furthermore, it's also got height, tilt, and swivel adjustments, although it cannot be pivoted, and therefore you can't rotate the monitor. Now, the monitor stand, if it's not up your street, can be replaced by a Visa-compatible stand, also allowing it, for example, to be wall-mounted. Now, at the rear of the monitor, you might have actually noticed that there's some RGB lights, and indeed, these can be enabled or disabled via the monitor's OSD. Elsewhere, you've also got a white finish to the monitor, which is actually quite a rarity. Of course, at the front of the monitor, it is all black. 
Aside from this, at the rear of the monitor you might have noticed a rather large cutout, and that is of course because it has got a 5 watt woofer. This combines with the two 2 watt speakers which are forward facing to give you a 2.1 channel configuration, which is quite a rarity in most modern monitors. The monitor speakers have been tuned by Trevolo and you have got dedicated EQs that you can select through the monitor's OSD. The one I would suggest is the Cinema EQ. Now on the subject of audio, you have got a 3.5mm audio jack. And in terms of your video input, you've got a singular DisplayPort 1.4 input and two HDMI 2.1 inputs. Of course, these will carry sound as well, therefore allowing you to access the 3.5mm jack via your headphones. Past this, you have also got four USB Type-A ports, which can be handy for plugging in your peripherals, and for you to access them, you'll have to connect up to your computer via the included USB Type-B to Type-A cable. Now aside from all of this, there is also a built-in microphone, and indeed right now I'm going to be antisocial, look away from the camera and face the monitor itself because that is where the microphone is positioned. Now you can turn off the microphone if you so wish, and when it is on there's a small little green light at the front indicating that is actually in operation. Now I've got the sensitivity right now at 8, but that is of course very subjective, and in terms of my window settings it is set at 50%. Now as for the polar pattern, the private mode effectively means that when you're facing the monitor it's going to pick up your voice and not too much of your surroundings. Now for me to just demonstrate it, I'm just going to shift my voice to the left while continuing to speak and then shift my voice back to the middle and now back to the right. I know it's going to look very odd on video, but nonetheless it gives you a bit of an indication of how it performs. Now doing the same sort of test but with the omnidirectional polar pattern, I'm going to shift my voice all the way to the left, go back towards the middle and then shift my voice back towards the right. So hopefully there you can pick out there some differences and therefore most people will probably want to go on the private mode. Now as for the noise cancellation levels, I would recommend level 3, but you've got level 2, level 1 and also level 0. Now on level 0, the polar pattern actually gets disabled and greyed out, and you might be able to pick up a little bit more static sounds, specifically if I go quiet. Now indeed over here, if I were to re-enable noise cancellation mode and go to level 3 and then go quiet again, Hopefully here you can understand that actually noise cancellation does have a positive effect. But aside from going quiet, what about when it comes to any sort of background noise? Well, I've got a song which is from Priya J. It's titled Like Me and it's coming through my bookshelf speakers. And I've got the noise cancellation at level 3. And here I'm going to go quiet. And right now I'm going to continue to speak, but now ramp down the noise cancellation level to this level zero. And hopefully now you'll be able to pick up Priya J's vocals a lot more, even if I go quiet. So effectively there, what I'm trying to convey is that the noise cancellation does actually do a positive effect. And is something that you might want to use. You've also got a mute function, which I'm going to disable right now. So hopefully you were able to pick that out. So this just gives you an indication of how the microphone performs on the BenQ monitor and indeed it is something that you can utilize in any sort of scenario. The only thing that you should be careful about is that you will need a USB type A to type B cable connected up to the monitor and that is of course provided in the box. So there we have it, hopefully you've enjoyed my detailed overview of the BenQ Mobius EX3210U. I'd be curious to know what you make of it down in the comment section below. If you've liked this video, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I'll see you in the next one.